Alright, so we're back once again, and this time I'm going to do something pretty different to all my previous videos. All my previous videos have kind of focused on World of Warships to more or less the greatest of extents. But with this one, I want to do a little a little something different. I want to still kind of make the focus a bit, of, a bit on World of Warships, but at the same time I want to kind of focus more on the history of that surrounds World of Warships. Um, so with that in mind, I'm want to cover the HMS Warspite, maybe go through its like construction, um, its history, its operational history, and ultimately what happened to it. So with that in mind, let's get started. So the HMS Warspite was an Elizabeth class battleship. She was constructed and laid down on October 12th, 1912. She was designed to join the fast squadron of the British Royal Fleet, which was intended to operate against the leading ships of the opposing battle line. The turret in the ship, just like the one in the game, is no joke. At the time these guns were a revolution, as they were developed around the same time with the German British armatories and even Churchill himself, the Lord of the Admiralty at the time, being suitably impressed with their accuracy and power. The guns themselves were 381mm or 15 inches in diameter. They sat in a 4x2 configuration with two turrets sitting on each side of the superstructure. In terms of power, as I said beforehand, she was made to be a fast battleship and be part of the leading squadron of the Grand Fleet. As a result, she used oil as fuel, which was quite a new thing for the time. Warspite was powered by 24 Yarrow boilers and two steam turbine sets. This came together to give the Warspite a top speed of 24 knots. And a look at the battleship wouldn't be complete without a look at its armour. The Warspite had a waterline belt of about 13 inches of 330mm group cemented armour, along with deck armour of about 1 to 3mm. And in addition to this, the gun turrets were incredibly armoured with each beam made with 7 to 10 inch or 178 to 254 millimeter group cemented armor also. Now, during the interwar period, she did undergo several upgrades to its propulsion armor and armament. The reconstruction project replaced her propulsion machinery and installed six individual boiler rooms with Admiralty three drum boilers in place of the 24 Yarrow, Yarrow boilers. Geared Parsons turbines were fitted in four new engine rooms and gearing rooms. This increased fuel efficiency, reducing fuel consumption from 24 41 tons sorry, per hour to 27 at almost 24 knots, and give the warship 80,000 ship horsepower. The 1,500 long ton or 1,524 tons weight saving on her light machinery was used to increase the protection on armour and armament. Her armour also went under upgrades with 1,100 tons of extra being added, which mostly was added to the section forward of the A turret and the boiler rooms. The elevation of the 15 inch guns were also increased by 10 degrees from 20 degrees to 30 degrees. This provided an extra 9,000 yards of range for a total effective range of 29,000 and or not 29,000 but 29.5 kilometers. The operational history of the Warspite is something to behold. After recovering from colliding with her sister ship the Barnum, the Warspite joined the Grand Fleet on Christmas Eve 1915. On the 31st of May 1916, the Warspite deployed to take part in the Battle of Jutland. After a signalling error, the battleships of the 5th Squadron were left behind by the battlecruisers, and as a result, were exposed to heavy enemy fire from the German High Seas Fleet. Although it wasn't all one way, and the Warspite did manage to land ahead, her first, on the battlecruiser von Terdan. While trying to escape, the Warspite was hit by a shell that knocked out her steering gears. This, in effect, caused the Warspite to circle. She was hit several times, but did distract from the cruiser Warrior, which was very badly damaged while attacking the German fleet. Eventually, the Grand Fleet crossed ahead of the German battle line and opened fire, thus allowing the Warspite to slip away. The Warspite was hit 15 times during the battle, with 14 killed and 16 wounded. And with that, that was the real last action of the Warspite in the First World War, and generally was the last real battle of, in naval terms, during the First World War. The Second World War was a busy time for the Warspite. The first operation was Narvik. On the 10th of April 1940, she led nine destroyers into battle to neutralize a force of eight German destroyers trapped near the port of Narvik. Warspite destroyed the heavily damaged Z-13 Erik Kollner while damaging Z-17 and Z-12 alongside this. Warspite then made its way to the Mediterranean theater of war before the Italians joined the war on the 10th of June 1940. The British and Italian fleets eventually did meet at the Battle of Cal Calibra on the 9th of July 1940, and in it, the Warspite did something incredible. It hit the longest shot on a moving target from a moving target in history, hitting the Julio Cesar from a range of 24 kilometers. 
This in itself caused the Italian battleships to turn away in the face of superior British numbers using a smokescreen. The war spice next action was at the Battle of Cape Matapan. Through the use of air attacks, the Italian cruiser Pola became crippled. This led the British ships to pursue throughout the night until eventually detected the Pola and her two of her sister ships on radar. All three were destroyed for point blank range by the Warspite alongside the Valiant and the Barnum. Perhaps a part of the Warspite's commission which had the greatest global importance was the Normandy landings. On the 6th of June 1944, at 5 o'clock in the morning, the Warspite was the first ship to open fire, bombarding the enemy German battery at Villaville from 24 kilometers away to support the landings on Sword Beach. She continued the bombardment on the 7th of June until it was completely out of ammunition. On the 9th she took up a position at Utah Beach to support the American landings and then on the 11th of June she took up a position off of Gold Beach to support the British 69th Infantry Brigade near Christot. Her final task in company with the monitor Ebris involved carrying out a preparatory bombardment of targets around Le Havre prior to Operation Estonia on the 10th of September leading to the capture of, town, of the town two days later. Her final task was to support an Anglo-Canadian operation to open up the port of Antwerp, which had been captured in September by clearing the shield estuary of German strongholds and gun emplacements. With the monitors Ibris and Roberts, she bombarded targets on Walcheren Island on the 1st of November 1944, returning to Deal the next day, having fired her guns for the last time ever. On the 19th of April 1947, Warspite departed Portsmouth for scrapping at Faslin on the River Clyde. On the way, she encountered a severe storm and the tug Malinda III slipped her toe. In storm force conditions, Warspite dropped one of her anchors in Mount Spey, which did not hold, and the storm drove her onto Mount Mopus Ledge near Cudden Point. Later refloating herself, she went hard aground a few, a few yards away in Prussia Crow Cove. Her skeleton crew of seven was saved by the Penley lifeboat. There were several attempts to refloat her, but the hull was damaged badly. In 1950, an attempt to refloat her was tried. A large crowd in the media washed on as the salvage crew set to work. Despite the use of 24 compressor tanks pumping air into her tanks, the salvage failed. There was insufficient depth of water to float her clear of the reef in a rising southwesterly gale. The salvage boat Barnet, standing guard overnight under, a war, under the warspite's bows, was holed in the engine room, towed off and eventually drifted ashore at Long Rock, a few miles to the west. However, by August the battleship was finally beached off St Michael's Mount and after further salvage, another attempt was made to refloat her in November. The Falmouth tug Masterman spent the night on the Hogus rocks after failing to tow Warspite and her sister tug Tradesman had 60 feet or 18 meters of wire wrapped around her propeller while trying to haul Masterman off the rocks. Aided by her compressor and two jet engines from an experimental aircraft, the Hulk was finally moved 130 feet or 40 meters closer to shore and by the summer of 1955 she disappeared from view. According to contractors it remains the largest salvage operation ever carried out in British waters. A memorial stone was placed near the seawall at Mare Zion and later moved a short distance. The stone was unveiled by Admiral Sir Charles Madden and prayers were read by a former crew member. The remains of the mass lie in the yard at Port Portenall's house and one portion was erected on a headland overlooking Prussia Cove. One of her 15 inch tompions and her chapel door are held in the Royal Navy Mu Museum in Portsmouth. Her nameplate was held by the pub The Wink in Cornwall but has since been sold at auction. Her ship's wheel was given from King George VI to King Hakon VII in 1947 who later gave it to the city of Narvik. It is kept in the city hall of Narvik. And that basically sums up the war spite, the British battleship. If you like this maybe leave a comment down below, a like, a subscribe. But until next time I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one.